turned one of those lawn bowling fields into a um, community garden. People are finding new ways to experience community. And here's some of the key lessons I think we need to follow if we're going to build really broad and inclusive community engagement. They seem like really common sense. They're not rocket science, but we have gotten so far away from them. I just want to remind you. So remember I said Robert Putnam said the biggest thing breaking down community is television. I've been stuck in hotel rooms for the last few nights. And I've turned on the television. Think, oh my God, if this is our competition, <laughs> and we're losing, <laughs> we're doing something terribly wrong. If we can't make community more satisfying, more fulfilling, more interesting than television. And I think the problem is, we have forgotten how to have fun. I've got a friend, he's actually in Calgary, he used to be an organizer in the Philippines, and I was an organizer in Calgary. He says, Jim, the problem getting people involved in community is those GD activists. I said, what do you mean, GD? He says, the grim and determined. <laughs> and it cracked me up because it describes so many sort of self-proclaimed community leaders I know in Seattle who are always negative, who like to complain all the time. And in many ways, they become the gatekeepers and keep everybody else away. Because some people gravitate to negativity, but most people get involved because they have a sense of hope, of optimism. Why else would you get involved if you didn't, if you didn't think you could make change? I got another friend who says, why have a meeting when you can have a party? <laughs> think about it. The purpose isn't who can endure the most suffering. <laughs> The purpose is to build relationships. And can't you do that a lot more through fun than you can through meetings? And yet we always resort to meetings as a way to try to build community. So I have a few stories about communities that learn how to have fun. So let me share them. This is from our Fremont neighborhood in Seattle. Fremont has lots of artists, and I find artists know how to have fun. So this is one of their many public artworks. This is called Waiting for the Inner Urban where people have been waiting for the bus for so long, they turned to stone. <laughs> this is a drawbridge coming into Fremont, and in the tower they put Rapunzel with her hair coming down in neon whites. As I said, in the late 1980s, people were really angry at City Hall. People were, you know, protesting, people were, were coming to public hearings, people were gathering petitions. In Fremont, they were angry too, but they simply erected a rocket on the side of one of their businesses, and they announced that it was aimed at City Hall. <laughs> they declared themselves the Artist Republic of Fremont. They started issuing their own postage stamps. Probably made their point better than any other neighborhood, but they had fun in the process. This is uh, an old power plant at the elementary school. It wasn't being utilized anymore, so they used our matching funds to renovate this as a place where artists could work with other community members to make fantastic costumes and floats for the annual Solstice Parade where they don't allow any commercial advertising, no motorized vehicles, just lots and lots of wonderful costumes made by community members. Really cool, it's just one neighborhood. So all kinds of beautiful costumes, but the parade is led by dozens and dozens and dozens of bicyclists wearing absolutely no costumes at all. <laughs> dozens of naked bicyclists. <laughs> Most people are having fun. <laughs> this is another bridge in Fremont, and um, I, you know this, this bridge is good for nothing. Underneath this bridge is good for nothing except holding up the bridge on top. So huge public safety problems, you know, drug dealing, illegal dumping. Any other neighborhood, I think they would have put fences up on either side to keep out the problem. Well, Fremont, they had a different idea with all these artists. They went under there and said, this is kind of cool space. It's almost like a cathedral. It's high ceiling, big columns. They started calling it the Hall of Giants. They said, we want to put a piece of public art under that bridge to attract legitimate activity. So they applied to our matching fund. This is the second year of the matching fund when the program was still very controversial. So I said, well, what's, what's, what's your public art going to be? They said, well, we don't know yet. Once we get the money, then we're going to put out a call for artists and we're going to let the people decide. 
I said, man, we can't fund that. We don't even know what it is. That would be the end of the matching fund. But as I said, neighborhood leaders make all the funding decisions. And they like this idea. They agreed to fund it. I thought, oh my god, that's the end of the matching fund. So they got their money. They put out a call for artists. Artists submit the models for what they want done with the bridge. Somebody submitted a large throne because it's the hall of giants. Somebody else submitted large of the life construction workers and engineers, kind of a tribute to the people who built the bridge. Somebody else submitted a troll. <laughs> I thought, oh my god, how would I explain to the mayor that we're going to use public funds to build a troll under a bridge we don't even have enough money to fill all the potholes? That'll be the end of the matching fund. So they put these models on display at the Fremont Fair where they have the solstice parade. And everybody who comes by the booth is entitled to vote for which sculpture they want under the bridge. So I kept going by voting for those construction workers because I figured they're the least objectionable. Guess which one won? Oh. Yeah, my worst fear. <laughs> and it got a whole lot worse. Because a couple days later, the art critic from the Daily Newspaper wrote a scathing review. She says, this shows the people should never be involved in public art decisions because the people have no taste. This is kitsch. It's a terrible waste of public funds. Uh, man, that's it for the matching fund. But her column so incensed the community that they started rallying behind the troll. They started doing street dances to raise money for the troll. The kids wrote a troll rap. I went to the neighborhood one day, there were 10 foot long footprints up and down the streets of Fremont like the troll been walking through the neighborhood. So they raised the money, they built the troll, here he is. That troll is so big, that's a real VW he's got, sort of an environmental staple, that's lifting it off the top of the bridge. There was some vandalism early on. Somebody broke out the window in the VW. But the neighbors responded and they organized a troll patrol. <laughs> they put lighting on the troll. They do regular walks around the troll in the neighborhood, making sure the troll in the neighborhood are safe. And it's what happens when people start to take responsibility for their communities again. They don't just call up the city and say, hey, there's problems with your troll. It's their troll. They take care of them. And they're always programming them. So at, um, they do Shakespeare on the troll. <laughs> at Halloween in Fremont, they celebrate Trolloween. Thousands of people come there. How about the troll and do processions through the streets of Fremont? At Christmas time, all the Santa Clauses gather there. We just celebrate the 20th birthday of the troll. Now, the troll brings people absolutely all over the world. Here's proof. <laughs> And when people come, they shop in the local business district. And there's always legitimate activity underneath the, uh, underneath the bridge, so there's no problems with public safety. Not a solution that would have come out of our police department, right? <laughs> Huge public safety problem under the bridge. Let's bring in the troll. <laughs> so they said, this is great. We need more public art. So they're looking, trying to figure out other sculpture they could bring in. And with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they got a really <laughs> good deal. On Lenin! <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce brought Lenin to the town square, where he presides over Taco Del Mar. <laughs> and here he is in the Fremont Solstice Parade. <laughs> and God, they have fun with, with they have so much fun with Lenin. Sometimes you give him shades and a guitar, and he's John Lennon. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> And during the gay pride parade, oh, no. he's dressed in drag. <laughs> and at Christmas time, we have the very solemn ceremony, the wedding of Lennon. Oh. <laughs> Creativity. But that's how one neighborhood figured out how to have fun. I'm going to share one more story about a community that learned how to have fun. That's, that's in Surrey. Y'all know Surrey, suburb yeah. of Vancouver? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's flanked by the SkyTrain. Well, right underneath the SkyTrain stop, they had a bench so people could wait for the SkyTrain, right in the middle of the business district. Well, some of the wrong people were hanging out on the bench. And so their solution was, well, let's we'll put, the council's solution was, we're just gonna put a fence around the bench <laughs> so those bad people can't get in. <laughs> and it's what's happening in way too many places where we're putting curfews on parks, where we're taking away benches um, in, in the name of public safety. So backwards. It's like, yeah, you keep out a certain element, but you also keep everybody else out. You can't create community without bumping places. Right? You absolutely need them. So the business people in the district said, this is kind of dumb. And the residents said, this is kind of dumb. And they petitioned the council, and the council still wouldn't listen to them. 
So they started a, oh, look at this poor guy. He needs a bench and he can't get in. So they organized a free the bench campaign. Free the bench. And they have an annual street festival. And you know where they have all the booths and they got a performance stage. And on the stage, they put the, the bench on trial. <laughs> and the local MP served as a magistrate. And here's one of the business people testifying. He says, you know, I've known that bench all my life. <laughs> it's a good bench. And they had one character witness after another speak to the good character of that bench. Hundreds of people were watching as a jury, and they voted unanimously, free the bench. <laughs> but the council still didn't listen. So they just had fun with it. They said, you know, this bench looks kind of lonely in here. Need some company. <laughs> and then they created a park bench with mannequins playing chess and it just captured everybody's imagination people saw how ridiculous this was and they were kind of ridiculing the council but it just got more and more and more people engaged and people just kept coming by to see what's going to happen there next <laughs> Well, the next thing was they created a park, a park bench with a, um, a birdhouse here. And then they created a living room. <laughs> they got a sofa, coffee table. I don't know how the hell they got this television over the fence. <laughs> oh my God. Then they, um, then they created Benchosaurus. <laughs> then they started folding origami cranes to decorate the place. And they put up a sign showing people how to make origami cranes, and people kept leaving more and more. So I just got more and more people engaged in the movement. It wasn't just a few people sitting around the committee, just a few people gathering petitions. Everybody got engaged. And at Christmas time, the poor bench was still there. So they brought in a Christmas tree. And they put it in a fireplace. And finally, the council gave up. <laughs> and they put up a notice saying, we're going to free the bench. <laughs> <laughs> and they took down the bench and invited everybody to come in and paint messages to the bench. So everybody wrote little love messages. And now that bench is free. And they're actually installing additional benches in the main district because they understand it builds community like nothing else. A second lesson I learned about being